not bad crab. It, it's come back a lot. As you can see, it's mostly large crabs. George Sweetman has been harvesting his livelihood from the Indian River Lagoon for two decades in waters near NASA's Kennedy Space Center. He moved to Brevard County, Florida after fishing the south shore of Long Island, New York for 35 years. Now he sees the same ecological collapse he witnessed there happening here, and for the same reasons. And then I moved to Florida 20 years ago because of brown tide. Uh, virtually put us pretty much out of business. Uh, same thing everyone in Florida has experienced over the past three years here because of massive development and expansion. In the past three decades, the population along the lagoon has doubled to 1.7 million people. The lagoon spans roughly 156 miles and six counties along the east coast of Florida. It is an estuary, a place where salt and fresh water meet, creating a diversity of life rivaled by few other places on the globe. This estuary is one of a kind. It's where subtropical and temperate northern climates converge, some of which occurs nowhere else in the world. Hi, I'm Jim Waymer, environment reporter for Florida Today. I'm here along the banks of the Indian River Lagoon in Melbourne, Florida. This is near a midpoint for the estuary, where openings to the ocean are few and far between. The lagoon's northernmost origins are at Ponce Inlet in Volusia County. The estuary winds south through Brevard, Indian River, St. Lucie, Martin, and Palm Beach counties. Its southernmost opening is at Jupiter Inlet. The estuary includes Banana River, the Indian River, and Mosquito Lagoons. Because it falls within a zone that includes both temperate and tropical climates, the Indian River Lagoon is considered among the most biologically diverse estuaries in North America. More than 4,000 species of plants and animals reside within its shallow waters, which average just four feet deep. But that rich cauldron of life is reeling under an onslaught, both natural and man-made. You have pollution coming in, you have development of the shoreline, you have an increase in boat numbers, you have, you know, all of these different things, not to mention, you know, natural things like freezes and hurricanes. When you put all those together, that's, you know, a serious threat to all of the living organisms in the lagoon. And I think what we're seeing now is sort of the cumulative effect of all of those different things. Since mid-2012, more than 140 manatees, 80 dolphins, 300 pelicans, and 40 7,000 acres of seagrass have died from somewhat mysterious reasons. John Treffrey, a professor of chemical oceanography at the Florida Institute of Technology, has been trying to get to the bottom of the matter for decades. Here he takes a sample of one of the largest contributors to the lagoon's health problems. So this is a little sediment grab we use to collect samples uh, in a place like this just on a dock. And I'm going to lower it down to the bottom. It'll sink in and then I'm going to close this little clamshell and uh, if there's muck here, we'll get a muck sample. So here we go, down into the bottom. It's pretty shallow here, just a few feet. I'm on the bottom, should have dug in. I'm gonna send this messenger. The message is close the bottle or the container. Here we go. Oh yeah, it's, it's definitely sunk into muck. I felt a vacuum as I pulled on it and it's heavy. It's a good sign. And so this is indeed full of muck. There it is. So. See, it has a little sand and shell in it, but basically, it's really fine, loose muck. Oh, it's really rich in hydrogen sulfide. Nobody wants to live in there but bacteria. And uh, yeah, it's uh, this is this is muck. This is the classic stuff. And Crane Creek is full of it, as are many of the other creeks. The spread of muck has been building for decades. Muck comes in from runoff of grass clippings soil and other things and it, historically it was found in the creeks and in the intercoastal waterway and some of the connecting canals back in the 80s and over time it's spread out so it, it occurs over a larger area and wherever you find this muck that's sort of like black mayonnaise uh, there's very little life in those sediments and so they really are a, a good overview of the problems we have in the lagoon because they represent all the things that have washed into the lagoon over time that we the people have introduced to the lagoon. Areas like this one behind me along Riverside Drive in Rockledge were once flourishing with seagrass. Not anymore. The diet of seagrass and other marine life has baffled biologists. As recent as 2009, seagrass had been growing at levels that hadn't been seen since the early 1940s. Decades of restoration efforts costing hundreds of millions of dollars finally seem to be paying off. 
and a recent drought meant less polluting runoff into the waterway. Then in 2011, the drought, extreme winter cold snaps, and decades of pollution conspired to awaken a green monster super bloom of phytoplankton, which cast a dark shadow over that success. The bloom was unprecedented in its scope and concentration, spanning some 100 miles of the lagoon. It sent the lagoon over the edge and dumbfounded the scientists who had been studying the estuary for decades. Ten years ago, I would have said about the trouble the lagoon's in that uh, we're doing good. And we got, we got blindsided in the last three or four years. It is now the worst I've seen in my 35 years here. Brevard County has taken steps to dredge some of the muck out of the most afflicted areas. In 2015, $10 million in state funds were allotted to dredge five sites. The mouth of Turkey Creek in Palm Bay, canals along Sykes Creek and in Cocoa Beach, the Grand Canal and Associated Canals in Satellite Beach, and waters near Jones Road boat ramp in Mims. The $10 million for the lagoon is just, is just the beginning, maybe 5%, 10%, and it's going to take uh, some local money as well as state money, perhaps some federal money to really carry this out. Dredging is just one piece of an ecological cure that scientists say will require billions of dollars, thousands of volunteers, and decades of sustained effort. Scientists with the St. John's River Water Management District are transplanting seagrass to areas where the estuary's most ecologically important plant has died off. An estimated 60% of the lagoon seagrass died after the 2011 superbloom, followed by two consecutive summers in which a brown algae turned the lagoon chocolate milk brown. The brown algae has devastated the shellfish industry for years in Long Island, but had never before been seen in the Indian River Lagoon. With formerly lush seagrass areas now barren, fishermen fear billions of future generations of sport and commercial fish have been lost. Seagrass provides prime habitat for fish, crabs, and other marine life, and is considered a key barometer of the estuary's overall health. Each acre of seagrass supports an estimated 10,000 fish and $5,000 to $10,000 in economic activity in the lagoon region. On a late summer afternoon, Lori Morris and Bob Chamberlain of the Water Management District inspect a site just south of Ozzy's Crab House in Palm Bay, Florida, called the Exxon site because it's near a gas station. There used to be 100% dense grass in this site all the way out past 300 meters from shore. Now we maybe have an average Total bed, maybe 5% max. You know, it's very sad. I really did. I took it for granted. I never thought it could disappear like that. I, it just amazed me. It is starting to come back now. It's very, very slowly. I guess we were just being a little more impatient than Mother Nature wanted us to be. The seagrass transplant is part of a three-year, $110,000 study. In the first year, had uh, four um, plots that were repeated three times. So you have 12 plots out here, and each of those blocks or three sets had a, you know, a plot with stakes in it, a plot with nothing in it as a control, a plot with the transplants unprotected, and a plot with caged plants. So we were looking at all these kind of different possibilities of trying to understand why the plants may have not been recovering this area. Some of the transplants couldn't withstand the voracious appetites of manatees, sea turtles, and other marine grazers. The small transplants, encircled within plastic fences or metal cages, became salad bars for the long famished grazers. They often munched up what grew back once protective metal cages or the plastic fences were removed. The good news was, was that the grass was growing. There is recruitment occurring. It's just going to take a lot longer than in areas where you have a lot more variability, this area has a lot more runoff, you have a lot more things going on, you know, it never was a high seagrass density area. So that's why it's so much slower than the northern areas. They recovered much quicker. Right. You know, when you look at some of the data from up there, there's just kind of a little blip, you know, from the blooms. Here at the Holliver Canal in North Merritt Island is where the Indian River Lagoon and the Southern Mosquito Lagoon meet. Early Native Americans once hauled their canoes over the narrow strip of land that separates these two water bodies. The first canal here was actually dug by slaves in the early 1850s. By the 1920s, it had become part of the Intracoastal Waterway, the 3,000 mile long federal channel that spans the Atlantic and Gulf Coasts of the United States. 
Hullover Canal sits within the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge, a 140,000 acre buffer to NASA's Kennedy Space Center. Because of the lack of urban development here, this was thought to be among the cleanest, healthiest segments of the lagoon. But by mid-2011, this area became ground zero for the worst algae bloom to hit the lagoon in recorded history. Scientists called it a super bloom. The density, scope, and destruction of the phytoplankton bloom were unprecedented in the lagoon's history. It had first been discovered in the Banana River Lagoon, then quickly spread here. It would come to cover more than 200 square miles, creating a virtual dead zone from north of Cape Canaveral, about 70 miles to Melbourne. Meanwhile, another type of algae bloomed from Melbourne, stretching another 70 miles south to Fort Pierce. Combined, the blooms would wipe out 60% of the lagoon's seagrass, or 47,000 acres, more than 73 square miles. So a perfect storm of sorts, fueled by drought, a cold spell, a severe algae bloom, and muck start to bring into focus why the lagoon is languishing. Scientists say it's not just the weather or any other one smoking gun. There are many culprits. John Windsor, a professor of marine and environmental sciences at the Florida Institute of Technology, has studied the lagoon for decades, and he points the finger mostly at us. We're standing by the lagoon right now, and the water here looks pretty turbid today. It's kind of a greenish-brown color and that's not the way it should be and it's been like that too much in recent years. It's from runoff from the mainland, it's from development activities, it's from sewage runoff, it's from agricultural runoff, it's from fertilizers in the yards, it's even from exhaust from automobiles and cars that winds up on the land that washes off the lagoon. But there's one key culprit that tops the list. I think stormwater is number one. It, it's, it, it's clear that it's a very large issue. And in fact, you know, before stormwater was an issue, the only thing we talked about was sewage plants. And as soon as we got rid of the sewage inputs from the plants along the lagoon, we realized things weren't improving the way they, we thought they were going to improve. And so then we found out that all this stormwater was having as much of an effect as the sewage plants were. And that's why we had to change our focus toward the stormwater. Some 140,000 septic tanks reside along the lagoon basin, many of them well beyond their intended lifespans. Here south of the 520 causeway on Merritt Island, thousands of septic tanks lurk underneath sandy soils often ill-suited for septic tank drain fields. Nobody knows how many fail, leaking excess nitrogen and phosphorus into the lagoon. I think one of the next steps right now that's really important is to work with decision makers and um, the utility companies to um, give them the science that they need to um, move forward on converting septic systems to sewer. I think that people are starting to buy into the science, but one of the you know, points of contention is, is the cost to hook up to sewer. And if we had some kind of federal subsidies or some, kind of, some way to make it a little less expensive for the homeowner, I, I feel like there would be a lot more buy-in. Other studies by Harbor Branch show dolphins near areas with a high density of septic tanks harbor more pathogens than dolphins captured in areas with fewer septic tanks. Other researchers say the lagoon's downfall can't solely be blamed on septic tanks. Some areas of the lagoon are in worse shape than others, depending mostly on how many people live nearby and the proximity of inlets where pollution can escape to the ocean. With a system this long, different problems plague different segments of the lagoon. Some of the estuary's most pristine waters are within the Canaveral National Seashore, near where NASA launches rockets to space and other worlds. The federal land set aside to buffer rocket launches wound up sheltering fish, birds, and other wildlife as well. Up this far, the water quality is still considered, considered fairly good. As you go further south, where you have more population, where you have more development, it, the the uh, quality goes down. So we tell people it is in trouble. But I mean, you know, it's education and governments coming together, communities coming together um, to fix it. Dr. Dennis Hanisak with FAU's Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute is seeing similar trends in the southern areas of the lagoon. But a wide inlet at Fort Pierce flushes out most of the pollution. Uh, some places never really had to die off, uh, like to the south and like around Fort Pierce. Um, some areas in Brevard County are starting to show strong recovery. Others are showing very little recovery. In Indian River County overall, it's been uh, pretty positive in the last year. 
It becomes clear that Brevard County's portion of the Indian River Lagoon is home to some of the estuary's most concerning problems. At 72 miles long, Florida's Space Coast contains nearly half of the Indian River Lagoon's length and 70% of its surface area. But Brevard County lacks a sufficient outflow that other counties get from large inlets. After the lagoon's northernmost opening at Ponce Inlet, there's not another inlet until Sebastian, 111 miles to the south. Over the southern 45 miles after Sebastian, there are three more inlets, Fort Pierce, St. Lucie, and Jupiter. The only opening to the ocean of any sorts between Ponce and Sebastian inlets is right here at Port Canaveral. But the Canaveral locks stay closed most of the time. Some say they should be allowed to be left open to let the lagoon flush out some of the pollutants. Others say a new inlet is needed somewhere in Brevard County. But Dr. Robert Weaver of the Florida Institute of Technology explains why that may be impractical. The benefits of a new inlet would improve flushing in the vicinity of that inlet. But unfortunately, uh, the, the geographical extent of, of the flushing is really limited to, uh, uh, to the area just, just around that inlet. And the costs associated with a new inlet go far beyond just the construction of the inlet itself, which, which by no means is inexpensive. I personally don't think a new inlet is the way to go. I think there's other engineering structures uh, that can be designed and built that uh, take advantage of existing infrastructure so we, don't have to go, uh, so we don't have to go down that road. George Sweetman, who used to crab in areas near the port, would like to see more done with the locks. I live at Cape Canaveral. I've fished there for many years, for the first five or six years, but the pollution got to such a level that there were no crabs because they're nomadic and they're not going to stay there if there's no food or the environment is not conducive for them to live. They're going to go where there's more tide, more flow. That's one of the reasons I, I don't understand why the government doesn't, don't open the locks with all the pollution in that area of the river why they don't open them on a more regular basis for better flow of clarity of water if they want to help. Weaver's not sure if opening the locks is the best idea. I think one of the largest hurdles to using the locks is that uh, you have boats that need to come in and out. Uh, it's, a, it's a managed structure by the Army Corps of Engineers. And, uh, and the way the locks have been built, I know when I moved down here three and a half years ago, they had already tried leaving the locks open uh, sometime prior to that. And talking with some, with some resources at the Army Corps, evidently the lock itself started to scour out. And uh, we're getting possible undermining of the lock system, as well as uh, sedimentation in the, in the port. So I think uh, the locks are an old structure, and, it, and it, soon it will be time to, to, to rebuild them. They're nearing the end, I believe, of their design life. Perhaps they could be rebuilt with this kind of increased uh, frequency of opening in order to allow flushing. With all the discussion of muck, brown tide, and algae blooms, many wonder if it's still safe to wade out and swim in the lagoon's brackish waters, or to eat the fish, shellfish, and crabs caught in it. Here at Rotary Park in Suntree, we recently spoke with fishermen and health officials to get their take. Cindy Lecky with Brevard County Health Department urges caution before taking the plunge into the lagoon or eating its seafood. It's a natural body of water, so you always have risks going into a natural body of water. When you go swimming into the river and natural um, bathing lakes, we recommend that you plug your nose, don't put your head completely underwater, watch when you're diving and jumping into the water. As previously mentioned, inlets to flush out a balmy stagnant lagoon are few and far between. Bacteria can spike after heavy rains with no water tests to warn the public. Some lagoon fish harbor a poison 1,000 times more lethal than cyanide, and one tiny cut can let in microscopic killers. One specific concern is Vibrio vulnificus, a potentially lethal flesh-destroying bacteria. The majority of the concern is people with a weakened immune system, people with chronic liver failure, or if you have an open wound. We don't recommend if you have an open wound to go into the lagoon because now you have an opening for the disease to come through. It is 80 times more likely for people to contract it if they do have a weakened immune system. We're really needing to target fishermen because they're the ones that are probably in those risk groups, especially since I think a lot of people look at it as, oh, I've been fishing here my whole life, but maybe only in the last 10 years are they in that risk group. 
And another really interesting thing about Volnificus is it almost exclusively infects males. There's some crazy combination of estrogen and estradiol. So 91% of patients are males over the age of, of 50. And so really that's like our fishing crew. And so we're really trying to target them. In 2013, two Brevard County men contracted Vibrio. Both were infected after fishing in the lagoon and each recovered, but it still prompted immediate health warnings. 62-year-old Mike Weldon of Melbourne was one of those two men who contracted Vibrio. His occurred in August 2013 while netting fish at a local fishing pier. He almost died. The first symptoms, I cut myself and then it started burning and then it got real red and then a big blister started forming on it. And then I started seeing lines go up my arm in the bottom here and uh, basically they Cut, cut it all off to drain it. Doctor uh, gave me 50-50 chance first, uh, it, actually it's the first 72 hours, but uh, I was critical the first 48. Yet despite all the problems and warnings, many local fishermen aren't deterred by the problems of the lagoon. I've been fishing here for a while and I do eat the fish. And I'm gonna continue eating the fish until they tell me I can't eat the fish. The, the warnings don't bother me. And eating five fish, 10 fish, per week is not going to kill you. Because of the lagoon's recent troubles, it's easy to get lost in all the warnings and bad news. But Lecky says it's not all bad in the Indian River Lagoon. Brevard County is very proud of our lagoon. We have this wonderful source of boating activities, fishing. We want everyone to enjoy themselves. Most of these toxins are very rare and it's a very low risk for people. We just want everyone to know that there is a risk out there. Healing our lagoon will be costly. A recent estimate said that over the next 15 years, it will cost $1.4 billion to meet new state limits on the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that enter the lagoon. The $1.4 billion estimate covers a span from the northernmost part of the lagoon at Ponce Inlet and Volusia County south to Fort Pierce Inlet. It does not even cover the portion from Fort Pierce to Jupiter Inlet. Florida wants to cut in half the amount of nutrients entering the lagoon by 2028. The state also wants to prevent the algae blooms that kill fish, seagrass, and other marine life. Restoring seagrass is one way of achieving this. Using oysters to cleanse the lagoon is another. Here at Flagler Park in Stewart is one example of how oysters are helping. Oyster reefs are, are really important to estuaries because they provide three main, what we call ecosystem services to the estuary. The first one is filtration. They're able to filter out water, up to 50 gallons of water a day for an adult oyster. So they help clean the water. The second one is because our native species of oyster in North America is a reef building oyster, those reefs that they create provide habitat for numerous different species. And lastly, the reef structures can also help stabilize shorelines. So they help protect shorelines from erosion and they can keep pace with sea level rise. Oysters are harvested in Brevard, then brought here to the Florida Oceanographic Coastal Center. The Marine Life Nature Center located on Hutchinson Island is situated between the Indian River and the Atlantic Ocean. So the hatchery that we have at Florida Oceanographic has helped produce the oyster spat for Brevard County's oyster gardening program. They are spawned in the hatchery, raised through the larval stage, set on shell that Brevard County has provided, and then Brevard County will, will take that shell and then distribute it to their oyster gardeners. We're the closest hatchery that can provide the service of spawning and producing the, the larvae, but then ultimately their oysters have to go back to Brevard County. So we want to maintain the, the integrity of those populations. Because there may be adaptations that we don't know about yet, that may be important for them to survive in, that, in their home range and vice versa. Oysters and other natural resources are also being used to help the lagoon by creating what is called living shorelines. Initially, these programs were being done in state parks, like at Turtle Mound in Canaveral National Seashore. Turtle Mound is a prehistoric archeological site located nine miles south of New Smyrna Beach. It is the largest shell midden in the mainland United States. The concern was that with things like sea level rise and severe shoreline erosion is that the midden was actually being threatened and we were starting to uh, lose artifacts and some of that history that's buried in the midden. So the park wanted a stabilization method that looked natural. So that's where the living shoreline stabilization came in. 
What you guys are seeing here are the uh, red mangroves, and you can see where the prop roots are starting to uh, form and extend out from the base of the tree. Now, this is what we're looking for in terms of uh, erosion protection. Those prop roots will just kind of all grow together until they actually create a wall that will then sort of block the waves as they're coming onto shore. So the hope is that as this develops, we'll just create sort of this line of red mangroves with the uh, roots kind of all growing together and overlapping. And that should act as a, a really good protection for the midden. The good news here is that this is working too. Another step towards purifying the lagoon has been restrictions on fertilizer use. Fertilizer from your lawn can enter the lagoon through stormwater pipes like these. So in March of 2014, Brevard County Commission adopted a rainy season fertilizer ban, joining more than 50 local governments statewide that had already done so, including most along the Indian River Lagoon. The summer of 2014 was the first year the restrictions went into place in Brevard County. The ban runs from June 1st to September 30th, and is intended to give the Indian River Lagoon a respite from the nitrogen and phosphorus influx that fuels toxic algae blooms. It's still kind of early in the effort. I do think that the people that are aware of the ban, you know, have been following it. Um, the question is, did everybody get the message? Because I'm sure if people know about it, they wouldn't want to, you know, just go ahead and do it without it. Because it seems like the majority of the county really like the Indian River Lagoon. So, yeah, seems like people are, you know, cooperating with the ban. The grassroots solution is always the best solution. And if we can get people in a neighborhood saying, yes, let's save some money, let's not buy fertilizer. Hey, let's make sure that we're not letting anything run off of our land. Yeah, it's got to be one person at a time. We can't dictate it. We've got to just have people think that it's worth doing. That's a hard, hard goal to achieve. Some wonder if fertilizer should be banned year round. But Scalera's not sure she'd go that far. Throughout the whole year would not be good because plants do require nutrients to grow healthy, so we can't go without, you know, fertilizing at all, ever. There's still plenty of hope for the Indian River Lagoon. With so many scientists, conservationists, and private citizens working so hard towards a cure, there are already signs of healing beginning to be seen in the estuary. I do have hope for the lagoon. The, the, I think that it's going to take a lot of people working together and, and, and coming together on, on policies. Um, I, I think that, in, that activism and science can only go so far, but it is going to take some political will and some public support to do that kind of thing. But I'm optimistic. I think, I think that the public is behind this, and uh, we're going we're gonna to fix the lagoon.